Let's open in a word of prayer, and then uh, we will get into our study the second session. Father, again, we just thank you that we can come together once again to look at your word on uh, a topic that America seems to be struggling with this, this time in, in my lifetime. Uh, I just pray, Father, that you encourage us, that you teach us first to me and then to our congregation. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Butler. Um, my topic today is kindness, and I just want you to know I'm not happy about it one bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday when I was watching that football game, I was thinking, I'm teaching on kindness today. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Our scripture passage for this today, I'm kidding, by the way. Our scripture passage, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Uh, this is going to be my pre-Christmas, post-Thanksgiving message, first to me and then to, to you and anyone else that's listening. We are, a time in, we are at a time in my lifetime where the elements of verse 31 are at an all-time high, People are looking for a reason to fight. Civil discussion has become a thing of the past. Even those people groups that have been traditionally passive are joining in the fray. You can see if you're involved in any kind of social media, you'd name it, it doesn't matter. Somebody can post on social media, Merry Christmas, and then everybody starts responding. And before long, they're calling each other morons and idiots and I mean, it's just, people are just, they're, they're way out of hand. You know, if, if I had our president's ear, the one thing I would ask him is to be kind. You know, I wish you were a little more kind. Uh, and I'm not saying that to be critical of our president. When I look at him, it's, I'm looking at a, to me, it's a mirror. It reminds me, am I being kind like I should be? Uh, I've got a little dog at home that, that can push my buttons just like that. I mean, he's, he's a cute little dog. He's too cute, actually. That it's, he gets away with a lot because he's cute. He, um, he's a pretty sweet little dog, but about, not about 90% of the time, but there's that 10% where he just decides to do everything that I don't want him to do. And, and I feel this rush come into me, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not being kind. Now, granted, it's a dog, but it's a great uh, lesson to me about kindness every time I deal with him. And so it's, it's a constant struggle. Uh, I've heard Christians say that we are tired of being pushed around. It's time to fight back. Um, well, I kind of agree with that, but let's look at real quick. Let's look at Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, even the heavenly realm. Uh, you know, God gave us weapons to fight with, but it's spiritual. It's not about, you know, nanan and getting somebody's face and, you know, joining in the name calling. and uh, It's about... We have got to become a, a kind, you know, President Daddy Bush, what, I can't remember his name. He, he had this, we want to be a kinder, gentler nation. Well, we've gotten away from that. We have so gotten away from that. Um, it's time to fight back is what many Christians are saying. They use passages like Mark 3, 5, where it says Jesus looked on them with anger. Ephesians 4, 26, it says, be angry, but do not sin. Uh, James 1.19, be slow to anger. It means you, you know, and their saying is, we can get to angry, we just got to be slow about it so we do it the right way. You know, and of course, they ignore verse 20 of that same passage. It says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Matthew 23, 27, Pharisees are hypocrites and whitewashed tombstones. You know, a, a common quote is, you know, Jesus wasn't always kind. And I love how we try to justify wrong behavior by playing the WWJD card. You know, well, Jesus did it. Well, uh, Jesus crawled upon a cross and died for all the sins of mankind. Every man, even the vile, yucky ones, as we might want to say. Uh, he, he was tortured. He was willing to be tortured and crucified. Um, 
You want to be like Jesus? How about something a little easier? You want to be like Jesus? How about uh, praying like for hours at a time because you have such a des great desire to be with your father? Can we do something that simple? You know, but we need to be careful before we start playing this like Jesus. Now, granted, we do want to be like Jesus in attitude, but everything that Jesus, you got to remember something. Everything that Christ did on this earth, whether it be fashioning ropes to make a whip to drive the money changers out of the temple or telling the Pharisees they're a bunch of hypocrites or telling Peter to get behind me, Satan, everything Jesus did, Jesus didn't, didn't scratch his nose without it being in the plan of God and how it was talked out in eternity past. Everything that Christ did was to, to get him to the cross to die for the sin of every one of us. So we got to be careful when we want to say, well, it's okay to be unkind and to fight back and because Jesus did. Well, Jesus had very specific reasons. And, and you know, in my finite mind, I could only guess why. I, you know, maybe he was wanting to make some enemies so he'd be sure to get hung on the cross. I, I, you know. But there was, there was a specific reason Jesus did everything he did. But Paul, was, Paul has told us, it's time to be kind. It's time to put away all of this stuff that we're doing that's, that's creating such turmoil in the Christian church and that's turning people away from the Christian church. Uh, Jesus, Jesus displayed all the attributes of God. Kindness was only one of them, however. Romans eleven twenty two says, Behold, then the kindness and severity of God to those who fail severity, but to, that, uh, but to you, God's kindness. Never forget that Je um, everything he did while he was on earth was, was about getting him to the cross. Uh, and by the way, Jesus was extremely kind. Uh, his enemies, uh, his kindness was what attracted people, especially children to him. Luke 6, 35 says, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Give. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So right there is an example. Our kindness should not stop at people that's easy to be kind to. Our kindness should be spread out to any and everyone. So I want to look at five aspects of kindness this morning from that Ephesians 4.31 passage. I want to look at the extent of kindness, Christian kindness, the depth of Christian kindness, the pattern of Christian kindness, the instrument of Christian kindness, and the source of Christian kindness. Looking at the extent of it, how much kindness should we show? Should we take and take and take and take and take and finally give back? What should, be, what, what should kindness replace? Well, Paul says in this passage, he says, uh, when you start asking what kindness should replace, how about bitterness? Yep, you should replace that. How about outbursts of clamor and belligerence? Yep. How about rumor mongering and evil speaking behind backs? Yep. How about malice? Yep. All these, no exceptions. All these must go. All of these have to go in order for kindness to step in and take its place. And when we have kindness, that's when we're going to start winning people to the Lord, winning people to our church. Somebody was telling me recently about somebody that's in our church that was here because of the kindness that they felt. Uh, you know, that's where it starts. Kindness is, is a manifestation of love. Kindness is a manifest, goodness is a manifestation of kindness. These things that, that Paul describes in verse 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice, uh, these are part of the old corrupt self that Paul opened with, uh, and it must be put off. All kindness is the opposite that replaces these things. It is the new self that Paul described in verses 23 through 24, where he talked about putting on the new, new self, uh, which or putting off, laying, oh, excuse me, let me just read it. Uh, it, it is uh, in that reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed by the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. So when Paul says in Ephesians 4.26 that we should be angry but not sin, and then says in verses 31 and 32, get rid of anger and be kind, what do we take him to mean? Anger in and of itself is not a sin. 
It's the attitude behind the anger. Uh, it's a great and dangerous weapon, however, because it's based on passion and it's brought on by the excitement or agitation of the mind. If used without the ministry of the Holy Spirit where anger is righteous indignation, it can quickly erupt into the things stated in verses 31 of our passage. This leads to an attitude of revenge. Apart from the Holy Spirit, the deception of man's heart will justify all sorts of anger as godly. He is choosing kindness. Uh, he, uh, Paul is saying to choose kindness before anger. He's saying just get rid of it. You know, this thing about anger, you can be angry as long as you don't sin. I'll tell you something. I haven't figured that one out yet. Huh. I, I, you know, if you have, God bless you. If you have, sit me down and teach me. I have not figured out how to be angry and not be sinful. I mean, I can just feel it in my spirit. And so this righteous indignation, when Paul says, just stay away from it, don't even go there, he's talking to me for sure, because I don't know how to do it. Um, that might be a lesson for me, Ron. Teach me how to be angry and not be sinful. <laughs> Let's look at the depth of Christian kindness. The point here is that Christian kindness is not merely an external change of manners. It is an internal change of the heart. Verse 32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Christian kindness is tenderhearted. If the heart is hard on the inside and the manners are, are meek and polite and helpful on the outside, that's not Christian kindness. The idea behind tenderhearted is that our insides are easily touched. When your skin is tender, it doesn't take a very hard touch to make it hurt. Uh, when your heart is tender, it is easily affected. It feels easily and quickly. When you stop and think about it, it is remarkable that this is commanded by the, uh, Paul. You can't just decide to be tender-hearted and turn it on and off like a faucet. Uh, it is a deep character quality. Where does it come from? How can we obey this command to make our kindness to each other deep and heartfelt and not superficial? You know, we know kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness has got to come from the Holy Spirit. It has got to, got to be a godly kindness. It's not something that we can drum up, something that we can muster up, something that we can, you know, oh gosh, I've got to put this on now. I've got somebody coming that's going to get on, push all my buttons, so I've got to be sure and be kind to them. No, it's, it's a way of life because it's, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to minister through us. The pattern of Christian kindness, two patterns of Christian kindness are given for us in the text. First is the forgiveness of God. Second is the love of Christ. First we see in verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. So when kindness calls for forgiveness, the pattern is forgiveness of God in Christ. You know, um, The pattern of forgiveness of, of, of God in Christ, this pattern, uh, God is not flipping about sin. God hates sin. And he saw sin, he named sin, and then he covered sin with Jesus. The second pattern is seen in Ephesians 5, 2. If you want to turn there, it says, And walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Kindness is, is a manifestation of love. I said that earlier. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness is, is done in good deeds, you might say. Uh, I, I just saw a story this morning as I was getting ready for church about this lady, a middle-class lady, was driving down a road, and she ran out of gas. She got out of her car. A homeless man walked up that looked pretty much, I mean, he was obviously a homeless man. He told her to get back in your car, Lock the doors, and I'll be back. And within no time, he came back. He had gas. He gave it to her. He took the last $20. I'm a homeless man. He took the last $20 he had. He bought her gas, and he sent her on her way. I mean, you know, that kind of kindness is, is unfathomable, apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But that's the kind of kindness that God is asking for us to do. 
And, it, and the lady saw that it was a good deed. It was, and, of course, she, then she had, the story goes on to say that she was so touched by it, she started a GoFundMe account for the guy and to find, you know, raise some money to buy him a house. And they've come up with $350,000 was the last count. I mean, it's just, just amazing. But all this guy thought about was, I want to be kind to this woman. And I don't have, I'm living in a cardboard box in a shelter somewhere. But she needs gas, and I'm going to take the last $20 of my name, and I'm going to buy this woman some gas. Because he understood, it apparently appears that he understood this kindness that I'm talking about. <clears throat> kindness is a manifestation of love in Christ. People's desire to see punishment of sin affects their ability to show kindness. When we, get, uh, when we come to an understanding that Christ was punished for all sin, we don't need to see sin punished. If we can ever get to the point to where we're content on seeing the sins that are committed to us or sins that are committed to somebody else, if we can understand that they don't need to be punished, now there's consequences for actions, I get that, but, but this attitude of, you know, you've you got to get what's coming to you. Christ got what's coming to them. Christ took that sin. Christ bore that punishment on the cross. And as soon as we can get that attitude, then our attitude of kindness can can come out stronger and rather than this attitude of revenge or this attitude of they, something, somebody needs to get back at them. Uh, where does it come from? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, much, of, much like God's forgiveness was costly, it cost him his son, so is our, our, so is our kindness costly. We miss out on the sweet taste of revenge. And boy, it's sweet. Boy, we enjoy it. We love it. And we're not willing to give that up in order to be kind at times. The instrument of Christian kindness. What is the instrument of Christian kindness? What is it that we employ or exert in order to become kind and tender-hearted? The answer is found in the form of the verb to be put away that's in our, in our verse 31. Literally, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and glamour and slander be taken away from you. It's a passive verb. It's not asking you to do it. It's asking you to allow it to be done to you, to be taken away from you. Removing these things and putting on kindness is not of ourselves. If left up to ourselves, we will no more be able to get the bitterness and malice out of our heart than we can to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It doesn't lie within will or flesh or self. Self is the great enemy of kindness. They must be taken out of us. Let all bitterness be taken away from you. Let all wrath be taken away from you. Someone else, at, uh, someone else is at work here. It is the same thing we saw in verse 23 of this same chapter where it says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Another passive verb. Allow someone else to renew you. We talked about regeneration this morning in our, our, our class with our kids. Once we accept Christ as our Savior, we are made new. We are regenerated. I use the example with them of how they take these old cars on these TV shows, and they're just these junkers. And all, before long, they've got these things looking spit and polished and running great. And I mean, that's what happens to us at regeneration. We're made new. And part of being made new is, being made, is, is having a, a power inside of us to, to enable us to be kind at times where we don't want to be kind, where we don't feel like being kind. Be renewed by the spirit of your mind. And, uh, there must be a renewing of, by the Holy Spirit. There must be a power that takes away bitterness and malice from my heart and makes me tenderhearted and kind. Uh, and we look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where the fruit of the spirit. If the spirit, goes, uh, if the spirit of God does not come into our lives to do a supernatural work, we may be able to spruce up the outward manners of kindness, but the poison within us remains. It is not up to us to put on some superficial act, but it's up to the Holy Spirit to pour out of us this fruit that is promised to us. Of that, Paul says, let it be taken away. Talking about the things of verse 31. We must still ask, what is the instrument with which I appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit? The answer is faith. The Spirit flows in the channels of faith. Paul cries out in Galatians 2, 3, 2 through 3, 
This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, now you're, perfecting the, now you're trying to perfect it through the flesh. You, you receive salvation through faith. You started out with faith, but now you've, you've gone away from it. You're trying to run things yourself. You're trying to act as the Holy Spirit. In my Holy Spirit class, I talk about how the Trinity in many people's lives is God the Father, God the Son, and me. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the, the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to run it on my terms and, and my way and do things the way that I think they ought to be done. And that's not how it's supposed to be. And, and you don't want it that way. You do not want it. You won't. I mean, I don't want to try to take away this malice and, and this stuff because I guarantee you it won't happen. But when I got somebody else pulling it out of me and I'm allowing that, it makes it so much easier, so much easier. Uh, he continues in that passage. He says, uh, are you foolish? Having been with the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh. Then, he said, then we look at the source of Christian kindness. The text tells us that we must believe if the Spirit of God is to conquer unkindness in our hearts, there must be three things. We must believe that Christ died in our place. In order to have this power, we've got to be saved. We've got to know that Christ died for us, God buried, or he was buried, and, and God raised him from the dead. And at that point, when we become saved, when we become a child of God, this is when we get this power to do these things, to, to, to put on this true Christian kindness. Uh, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, Ephesians 5, 2, uh, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. We must believe that God has forgiven all our sin. Ephesians 5.32, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. To know and believe that every slap in God's face has been forgiven freely in Jesus Christ should break a Christian's heart and make it lowly and tender and kind. You know, we take that for granted. God's glorious forgiveness is a fact that Christians either don't really understand or, like I said, we take it for granted. If we really focus just five minutes a day on, the, on what God did for us. God removed this from us. God, in spite of us, saved us when he didn't have to. God didn't need us. God chose to save us. God chose to reach out for us. God, you know, uh, in, in Genesis, after Adam had sinned, God walked around and says, Adam, where are you? God is always looking for us, always searching for us. God wants us. Why? I mean, why would he want us? It's one of my questions I want to ask him. You know, he doesn't need us. But yet he loved us so much, and he loved us enough to send Christ for us. And he loved us so much that in sending Christ for us, our sins are forgiven. We want to beat ourselves up over something that we've been forgiven over, that, that, or that we've been forgiven for. Finally, and most importantly, we must walk in the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Only then can the fruit of kindness be poured out to us, or poured out of us to others. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And the desires of the flesh are bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and all forms of malice. Just to name a few. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Uh, for the flesh it sets its desire on, against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Unkindness can be sweet for the moment, but Christian kindness can have an eternal effect. If we're going to win people to Christ, if we're going to win people to our church, we can do it through kindness. We can reach out. You know, we're coming into a season now where you see the kindness meter get pegged. Everybody wants to go out and do an act of goodness, you know, help the poor or feed a family or give them Christmas presents or whatever. Uh, I think when I see that, I always think of camp. When we, when we come out of camp, everybody's on this high. You know, yay, rah, rah, Jesus. Yes, go. And then it's, it falls off. And we're, that's, that's one of, the, as directors, that's one of the things that we're always looking to try to figure out how to overcome that. 
The thing, same thing could be said about this attitude that we have in this time of the year. We have such a giving, loving, kind heart this time of year, and then as soon as December the 26th hits, it's gone. Or it's, or it's lessened. It's not gone. I'm not going to go that far. But it's definitely lessened. Why? And why all of a sudden are we living in a country that's so angry that kindness is just, it's a thing of the past? Well, it's got to start with us. It's got to start with the church. You know, we have got to, to allow the Holy Spirit to pour kindness out of us to people that we don't want to be kind to, to love people that's not lovable, uh, to that little dog that drives me crazy at times, you know. But, but we've, we've got to show kindness. We've got to show love. And in do, doing so, there will be eternal effects. There will be eternal effects. The unkindness, the, the revenge, it may be sweet for the moment, but it's not worth it. Not worth it. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you today that, that you've given us kindness that we can share with others. That your Holy Spirit will pour it out, upon, out of us in ways that will just change a world. We pray, Father, that, that it starts with us. That, that you make this clear to us. That you help us to see this great need of something that is so lacking in our country and in our churches today. And then, Father, help us to, to reach out to others, to share the, the message of Christ and wrap it in kindness. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus. Amen.